Hi, today we're going to talk about assessment and gifted learners, which as you may remember from the beginning of this course is my area of specialty. So this is one of my favorite lectures to give. So I'm really pretty excited. And again, we're going to focus a little bit on what giftedness is and what gifted learners are. And then we're going to talk more specifically about assessment and this special population. So let's get started with um, a quick question about what do we mean by gifted learners? When I say what is gifted, um, what do you think of? What terms come to mind? Um, what is the definition of gifted? Yeah, so there's probably a lot of things that come to your mind. And what I want to emphasize today is that I could ask 20 different people um, about their definitions of giftedness and I could get 20 different answers. So, um, especially among the researchers in the field. So we don't have consensus on this. And, um, but I do want to talk to you about a couple of different ways in which people have defined giftedness. So the National Association for Gifted Children is the largest organization um, that represents gifted children in the country. It includes parents, teachers, um, administrators, and researchers in the field of gifted education. And they define giftedness um, in a group um, that they put together a few years ago um, as people with outstanding aptitude. Remember that word aptitude from um, the beginning of the course? So aptitude would really be considered that intelligence level, right? Um, or competence, and competence would really be equivalent to that achievement in an area or a domain. So aptitude or competence, so aptitude and achievement in a, in a domain, um, and that domain could be an activity with a symbol system like math or music or language or sincere motor skills, things like painting, dance, or sports. So we don't often think of giftedness having to do with sports, but the analogy makes sense, doesn't it? Let's compare this definition to some other definitions. Um, the Columbus Group um, talks about giftedness um, in terms of asynchrony. So they're really kind of looking at um, early childhood development in a way, and they're thinking about um, asynchrony in this idea that um, we have, we all develop at different levels at different times, and so maybe our um, cognitive levels way up here, right, but then our um, our physical development may be way down here. And so we might be developing at different levels, and we all do this, but gifted children do this um, in a qualitatively different way. And so a lot of times when we see gifted children, we see that they're intellectual and they're cognitive and their academic achievement, and levels have developed quite high, and their physical development or their, um, their, their social development might be delayed um, or might even be at the level you would expect, um, but their um, intellectual development has outpaced it. And that difference between their academic intelligence or cognitive levels and th what they're physically able to do or what their social communication skills might be um, is what um, creates the special needs for gifted children. Um, and then Gagné, he's one of my favorites, so here's a picture of Gagné. He's a French-Canadian researcher, and I really like the way he conceives of giftedness um, in this developmental model of giftedness. Um, and he talks about gifts and, and talents, and you can see this is his model here on the right. It looks kind of confusing, but really what we can talk about here is that we have our natural abilities, our gifts. These are the things that we're born with, and he talks about intellect, creativity, social skills, perceptual abilities, and then these kind of muscular ideas. And then these can be developed through kind of our environment and our mentors, our teachers, our motivation, through a developmental process, um, and hopefully through our school schooling experiences and our outside experiences. And these natural gifts can develop into areas of talent. And areas of talent might be academic, technical, in the arts, in the social services, in business, um, in games or in sports, um, etc. So our goal as teachers in this model might be to take these gifts that, that students come with, these aptitudes, and really as schools and as gifted educators or as teachers, can we develop these natural gifts um, into talents. Um, and then we talk about um, Dr. Renzulli, and this is who I studied with in my doctoral program. And Dr. Renzulli talks about giftedness happening um, in certain people, not all people, 
um, at certain times, not all the time, um, under certain, certain circumstances and not all circumstances. So rather than talking about gifted people per se, Dr. Renzulli talks about d gifted behaviors happening sometimes with certain people. And I kind of like this um, conception of giftedness in that one person isn't always gifted. We wouldn't expect someone to act like, a, like act gifted all the time, but it takes um, a set of circumstances and environment to elicit those really high level behaviors. Um, so we're not looking for consistency all the time, but we're looking for that to happen some of the time. And this corresponds to the three ring model. Um, so these gifted behaviors happen when we have a person of above average ability. So it does take some aptitude, but he's going to define this above average ability, aptitude, um, intelligence as um, in a little bit broader, like maybe the top 20% rather than the top five or 2% like we've seen other definitions. Um, also creativity. So in order to achieve this true giftedness, and we look at the elite people in any type of field, they in addition have an ability to think about these ideas in a different way. So it's not just that we can um, do things better, but we also think about them more creatively. And then task commitment. That means we're engaged with our behaviors or we're engaged in this task in order to complete them. So gifted behaviors happen when we have all three of these things working together. Um, and I kind of like this definition um, because it really helps us think about the environment that's conducive to eliciting these types of things. Um, and then finally, let's look a little bit at the Florida definition here. And this is from the Florida Department of Education. Um, and it talks about gifted being someone with um, superior intellectual development that's capable of higher performance. So I want you to notice here that it's talking about a capability, but not necessarily achievement. Um, and then it talks about the criteria. And we'll talk about the first part, part A, demonstrates a need for a program. Um, a majority of skills on a checklist, and then an intellectual development is measured by an IQ of two standard deviations of, or more above the mean on an individually administered IQ test. So all three of these things need to be demonstrated for a student to be identified traditionally in Florida. The first one is generally met through um, a nomination, and usually that nomination can happen from um, the student themselves, from another peer, from mostly from a teacher or a parent though. The next one is a standard um, scalar checklist. These checklists are developed by the district and they typically aren't used ex as an exclusion, but more of a check the box, make sure we get this done, but they're not usually used to exclude students from our program, which means that most students um, are or are not in a gifted program based upon number three, um, which um, when we, were, we go back to that standard, standard curve, those two standard deviations above the mean, um, really kind of look at that top two or three percent of, of the student population, right? The 98 percentile is two standard deviations above the mean. Um, also, I want to go back to that number one, that nomination form. What we found in that nomination is that it really does, um, it can be a point in which we see um, a disproportion um, of students nominated. So teachers tend to nominate students of their own racial background for gifted programs. So, or from from the majority racial group. So what we see is an over-identification in Florida and across the country of white and Asian students and an under-identification of Asian, Black, and Native American students. Oh, and Hispanic students. So we want to be sure that we are, um, we want to think about that in equity across programs and that we are, um, we would assume that giftedness would be equally distributed across race in our country. So it's a problem that we don't see this. And perhaps our roles are maybe perpetuating these types of issues. Um, we also could talk a little bit about how using standardized tests of, of intellect might also perpetuate these problems when we think about bias in these tests. Um, so to help get around this, um, Florida developed Plan B, and Plan B um, means that if a student's part of an underrepresented group, the district can create a different plan for identification, and the two underrepresented groups identified in Florida are students who are limited English proficient, so English language learners, or students who are from a low socioeconomic status family, so those would be students who qualify for free or reduced lunch. And every district in the state is allowed to create their own plan. In Duval County, um, our plan B involves lowering that IQ score to one standard deviation above the mean alongside a higher FSA score. Okay, 
So what do we notice in the difference in definitions? And I think the big one here is really that in all of the other definitions, we were really looking at increase in achievement as well, um, whereas the Florida definition only looks at that um, intelligence level or that capability, which um, I think Theoretically, you couldn't have achievement without ability. So if we see a high achieving student, but for whatever reason they don't have a high IQ score, then we couldn't identify them as gifted in Florida, even though that we would know that they are gifted. Um, in addition, giving that individually administered IQ test is very expensive. So we're talking about something like the WISC or the Standard Binet, which means which remember needs to be given by a school psychologist, so we're having to pay that school psychologist to give that test, um, which is also increasing the inequity of the um, services for gifted students in the state. Um, because what can happen is the school psychologists are backlogged, they're rushed when they're giving those tests in the schools, and so a lot of students are not getting them under the most ideal circumstances when given through the school district. However, students, however, parents and families who have um, increased funds may be going to a private psychologist who can give these tests under more ideal circumstances. Um, and when they're paying a private psychologist, you know, it's more likely that their student will um, have a higher test score, which would qualify them for gifted services. So we do see um, differences by income and who's identified for gifted programs, although we wouldn't expect there to be a difference in IQ based upon income. Um, so again, the rules in Florida might be perpetuating some of the inequalities that we see in gifted identification across the country. Okay, so another thing we want to think about is alignment. And we've talked a lot about alignment this semester when we talk about assessment. When we talk about assessment for gifted programs, we're talking about alignment in how we identify students, what our program does, and the evaluation of that program. So when we think about this, um, in Florida, we're identifying students based upon an IQ score, um, but that doesn't really help us plan a program. Remember when we talked about the beginning of the year um, IQ, and that doesn't help us know plan or plan curriculum. It doesn't help us know what a student is good at. It just kind of helps us know that they might learn faster. If I um, Let me talk about a different type of program. So let's say that I have a program where students are going to be doing advanced math. So they're going to be doing pre-algebra um, in sixth grade and then algebra in seventh and geometry in eighth. We already have lots of programs like this. What would be the best way to identify kids who would be good for an advanced math program? I hope all of you said math scores, right? I want to identify kids for an advanced math program based upon their math ability, their math achievement, right? So I'm going to give them a math test. The kids with the highest math scores will qualify for this math program, right? Um, so I have good alignment between how I identify them and the services that they'll receive, right? It wouldn't really make sense to identify kids for an advanced math program based upon their IQ scores. Now, theoretically, Students who have an IQ, high IQ would also do well in this math program, but not all of them, right? Some kids with a high IQ score might not be that good at math. They might have want to spend their time or have abilities in language arts. Um, in fact, some of the kids who have a high IQ might actually have a learning disability in math. It's quite possible to have a high IQ to be gifted and to also have a learning disability. We call this um, twice exceptional. So if kids who are twice exceptional have, um, who are identified, this means they're identified gifted, they have a high intelligence level, usually two standard deviations above the mean in the state of Florida, but they also have a learning disability or some other kind of exceptionality. So that might be dyslexia, it might be a math learning disability, it could be a processing disorder, it could be attention deficit disorder, it could be autism, and it's really difficult to identify these students. Oftentimes they're not nominated for programs for giftedness because their learning disability might prevent teachers from seeing their true gifts. Or alternatively, um, they could be identified for a gifted program, and because of their high intelligence, their special needs aren't identified until much later. Or, kind of maybe most heartbreaking, they're not getting services for special education or for giftedness that kind of balance each other out, and their gifts are never realized, and they're never getting the support they need for special services. So, um, twice exceptional absolutely a thing that can happen and something that not a lot of teachers know about. So I think it's important for us as pre-service teachers to be really informed and educated about this. Okay, 
So back to identification and program services. Um, and finally, that how we're delivering services should also inform how we evaluate the program. So let's go back to our math example. So we're giving kids early math experiences and advancing them through the math curriculum. How would I evaluate if my program's doing a good job? Right, I could look at their end of year algebra scores. So in seventh grade, when they take algebra, you know, two or one or two years early, are they scoring highly? If I'm getting high algebra scores, that would indicate a successful program. So now that evaluation program would say, you know, the way that I'm identifying students for this program is successful. So I have a circle here. So we want our identification of students to match the program services to match the evaluation. So we should have nice alignment between these things. Okay. So then we have areas of identification. So if we are going to identify students for programs, what are some areas in which other states identify giftedness? We can look at general intellectual ability. This is what we have in Florida. It'd be based upon an IQ test, right? What about achievement levels? We could look at something like the Iowa test of basic skills that had achievement across all. We could also look at specific content achievement levels, and this is probably more common. So I might look for kids who are gifted in math or English or social studies or science. And it's important to note here that if I identify kids in each of these four, it's not kids could be gifted in all four areas or one or two or three or all. So they're not excluding each other, but this allows us a little more flexibility. Right now in Florida, because we're identifying a general intellectual ability, we identify you for a gifted program and we put you in advanced courses, but if you're not good at math, you're still in this gifted program and the only way for you to participate in gifted is in a lot of cases to participate across the board in all of the subject areas, even if you're not equally good in all of them. And that can present a problem, especially for those twice exceptional kids, right? Um, creativity is another area in which we might have um, kids who are gifted. Um, I, how could I identify creative kids? I hope all of you are remembering that Torrance test of creative thinking that we looked at earlier. I mean, at the beginning of the year, we could also look at um, a portfolio of work that they've done, or we could have them do a creative problem solving task. What kind of program might we offer? There's programs like Destination Imagination, Future Problem Solving, um, extracurricular activities for creativity. We could also, in their coursework, um, have types of project solving um, activities and project-based learning that heightened that creative experience for students. And we could look at artistic ability in the fine arts, whether that be um, visual or music or theater or dance and thinking about and we actually do have a lot of programs that meet artistically gifted students needs right if we think about in Duval County we have schools for the arts we have um, sorry we have um, Douglas Anderson and we have La Villa School of the Arts at middle school and high school magnet schools where you audition and students with high levels of talent are invited to go even but even in a regular um, neighborhood high school we have art classes and we offer advanced classes um, in order to try to meet those needs um, but always we could use more funding and more experiences for students and it's not equal across the boards. Um, leadership is another area in which some states identify giftedness. And if we think about ways in which we develop leadership skills for students, we could think about um, opportunities within clubs um, for leadership experiences, also things like student council. Um, some schools offer specialized leadership courses. Um, there's even schools within Duval County that focus on leadership, such as um, Landon Middle School. Um, and we could think about leadership um, also specific experiences like lots of times um, there's you can work with the um, city council the mayor's office or the um, department of justice to um, develop these types of leadership skills um, and usually we identify leadership skills through um, resumes and interviews and recommendations from teachers and other adults Okay, so some major considerations. So when we're thinking about how we assess students for giftedness, there's a few things that I want you to remember. Some few things that make the assessment of students at the upper end of our normal distribution important. The first one's what we call the ceiling effect. So that most tests have a maximum limit and it's hard to distinguish between the top scores. So the best way to think about this is let's say that I'm measuring height and all I have is a yardstick. So if I'm measuring all of my college students' heights and all I have is a yardstick, right, am I going to be able to tell the heights of people? 
No, right? All I can tell is they're all taller than three feet, right? The yardstick's gonna work really well if I had toddlers, right? Because most of them are under three feet tall, so I can measure how exactly how tall they are. But once I get taller than that, I can't tell that I have a maximum limit to my measurement instrument. The same is true about tests. They have a maximum we call a ceiling effect, the ceiling to the test. So once students reach that high score, I can no longer tell who's the highest. And oftentimes our students reach that maximum ceiling effect. Um, the FSAs are a really good example. If I have a student who scores a five on the FSA and I have a whole classroom full of them, I can't tell how high they could have gone because I, they reached the maximum limit of that test. So it's really hard to show growth if they hit that ceiling effect at the beginning of the year. And this is a common problem we have in teacher evaluations with gifted students is that they've already reached that maximum. So one way to prevent that from happening is to give above grade level testing. So a lot of times when we want to measure the effectiveness of gifted programs, rather than giving the seventh graders the seventh grade test, we might give seventh graders the eighth or ninth grade test. Then we can show growth because they're less likely to hit a ceiling on that test. Okay. Cutoff scores is another challenge, and when I say cutoff scores, what I'm referring to is when we use a, a specific score to make a decision about services for giftedness, uh, for gifted services. We also run into this problem on the other end with special education services or even for RTI. So, um, and in gifted services, that 130, that two standard deviations above the mean is our cutoff for gifted services, right? But do you remember what we talked about when we talked about measurement error and that all tests have a measurement error, that nothing is exact? So we know that the test has a measurement error. So if I had a student who scored a 129 on the WISC, on the IQ test, would they qualify for gifted services? No, right, because they had less than a 130. However, they're within the measurement error of the test, that they scored within what we might consider error on the test. I don't know that their true score isn't actually a 130. So if they won't qualify for services based upon that score, but if I was going to give advice to that parent, I would say they should retake the test. Or they should, you know, it would be worth it to retake it because they're close enough to that cutoff that we don't know what their true score is. So there's a problem using a strict cutoff score because there's error within the test and we can't be that exact. Now, if a kid scored a 115, that's not close enough to a 130. We're pretty sure that that 115 is not close enough to a 130 for there to be that much measurement error in the test. We're pretty sure that that is not a 130. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and then the last um, question, uh, the last concept is regression to the mean. And this is a pretty complex statistical um, concept. But basically what regression to the mean indicates is that when we have a really high score, an outlier score, and that we often have with gifted students, so if the student gets a 100 on the test, the most likely outcome is that their test score will go down the next time because that is such a high score that it, the most likely outcome is that it will go down rather than go up. So and when I have lots of students or I have a student that scored really, really high on a test, no matter how much teaching and how much growth they make during the year with me, the most likely outcome at the end of that is that their score will go down towards the mean, towards the average score, then it will go up even if they learned. And um, so, when we're dealing with a population of outliers and a population of students that scored really high, this regression to the mean becomes really powerful and it becomes more difficult to kind of analyze those scores and to show growth. Um, so it's really important for teacher evaluations. So here's what I'd like you to do um, for just an activity is go through, answer these questions. If you have difficulty with them, let me know. I'll be happy to talk to you um, on phone, through email, um, or face-to-face -face in my office if you schedule an appointment. I look forward to seeing you this week. Bye.